Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Salatu ve selamu ala Resulillah. Eşref el enbiyai ve mursalin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve men tabi'un bi ihsanin ila yevmi din. Esselamu aleykum ve rahmetullahi ta'ala ve barakatuhu. Um, Jazakumullahu khayran for the organizers of this uh, program. May Allah put plenty of barakah and khair in it. Inshallah, it's an extremely important program. And I think the setting for it, although it's unfortunate that we are not in person this year, um, uh, as Sheikh Azim al-Din said, the fact that we are online actually allows for participation also for people from all over the place. Um, so there's good in everything. This is from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also that uh, the one who tafa'al khayran tajidhu, if you look for the good in things, uh, optimistically you will find it. So alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. Um, can I share my screen? I believe I should be able to. Mm. Yeah, okay. All right. Oops. Okay. Can everyone see this? Ne negotiating paradigms of Islam in the modern worldview. Is this clear? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, so the uh, the title of this year's program, this year's winter intensive, of course, as you know, mainstay of the Muslim, navigating modernity as a minority community. And I think this is a topic um, whose importance we do not need to belabor because it's crystal clear to everybody. We feel it. We live with it every single day. Um, and are often stymied and confused by it uh, and don't really know how to navigate our way. So we're going to try over the course of the next few days to learn the lay of the land, to learn how to navigate the ship, inshallah, in what are often very stormy and choppy waters. Um, and what I would like to do uh, to begin with is that I think a very important or a very fundamental aspect uh, that we need to have in place in order to deal with a lot of these challenges is to look at this question of what is a worldview? Because really at the, at, at the bottom of it, uh, so many things we look around us and we as Muslims today, we live in a world that is not of our own making, as it has been said. Of course, from the time of Islam, uh, after the death of the Prophet wasallam, the Muslims spread very rapidly and, and, and basically came to occupy much of the known world of the time. And for the following thousand years, Islamic civilization was dominant, as we all know, um, in, in, in material, political, and economic terms, as well as, of course, spiritual terms, uh, which is the most important. But there is no major world civilization that did not border the Islamic civilization and that was not deeply impacted by it, um, uh, you know, not least of them being Europe uh, itself. Um, over the last several hundred years, however, there has been a radical uh, shift of the balance of power in the world where the uh, Muslim world and all other areas outside of Europe, Europe slash America, has basically uh, retreated in a, at least a worldly sense and come to occupy a subordinate or peripheral position with uh, modern Europe rising as of, say, the 16th, but particularly the 17th century, to a place of prominence, uh, which ushered in the first kind of truly global world system in which the entire globe was now and is now still incorporated into one uh, paradigm. Uh, this paradigm is not of our making. The world would look very different if it were, um, but it is a paradigm that is based on uh, a European model, which starts out as a Christian model, model, but then secularizes as we move into the modern period. And this worldview, this way of looking at the world is pervasive now, uh, especially for us living here in the West, but increasingly over the globe, because there really is no East and West anymore, uh, especially after the rise of the internet, even before, but especially after the rise of, of, of modern uh, methods of communication, uh, everybody is everywhere and everything is all over the place. You, you can be in Jakarta, you can be in uh, Riyadh, you can be in uh, anywhere you want, and you have access to the same sort of cultural products, the same uh, entertainment, the same ideas. Very often your schooling is based on a Western model. You live in a modern nation state also based on a European model. Um, so how do we get to, so obviously for many of us Muslims today, we feel a great sort of tension within our uh, souls. And so, uh, so we feel that, that obviously there are conflicts. Islam says one thing, but the world around us says something else. We believe this is true, they say it's false. We believe this is false, they say it's true, and so forth, so on and so forth. And we often don't know how to deal with this tension. So my contention is that a very effective way to do it is to take a step back and look at the uh, overall paradigm from afar 
and to, first of all, conceptualize what is this thing called a worldview. So basically a worldview, I would say everybody has a worldview and a worldview, well, all right, so what is a worldview? I mean, here you have this picture of someone looking at a globe. Obviously we're not talking about it in terms of a physical worldview, but we're talking about a conceptual frame of reference through which one interprets the world. Um, as we said in the modern age, especially for many of us Muslims, we feel that there is sort of a tug of war going on. We grow up with Islam, but we also grow up in the midst of this uh, paradigm, uh, which is based on something, very, a very different set of assumptions uh, and, and, and process of viewing the world. And so we feel there's a tug of war between us and them, East and West, Islam and the, you know America and Europe and so forth. Um, and this often leads to uh, people talking past each other, people arguing, people getting into conflict. Of course, Samuel Huntington's famous, you know, clash of civilizations thesis is one manifestation of this, but whether one endorses the thesis or not, uh, clearly there is a, a lot of, um, you know, mutual recriminations, we could say, that take place on both sides or all sides of the uh, current uh, world situation. Um, so often we don't know how, how it is that we should communicate with other people. How can we make Islam known to other people? How can we make it comprehensible to other people as a very minimal first step? Because in fact, we are sent to make da'wah. We are actually supposed to call people to Islam. And we're having trouble nowadays even making Islam sort of uh, understandable and minimally plausible uh, to people, let alone calling them to it, right? So this, this raises a great challenge in the way we communicate with others. But also, and this is even more fundamental, we often feel a confusion within ourselves. There is no person who has grown up, I would surmise, in the modern world, Muslim who has grown up in the modern world, who has not had some very basic questions about, wait a minute, how could this be true? There are certain things uh, in the modern way of looking at things that conflict radically and fundamentally with Islam and vice versa, right? And because we are exposed to both of these paradigms, you know, half the time we're thinking with one hat and half the time we're thinking with another. And when these two conflict and clash with each other, very often it can lead to a, a profound sense of malaise for us internally. And it can even lead to, you know, the sort of rankling in the heart, uh, a, a disquietude of, of, of the soul. And also it can lead to actual questioning uh, of, of, of the faith, questioning of our commitments, questioning of our belief. According to some surveys, I believe a Pew survey, and I don't know, uh, you know how accurate it is, but it is estimated that up to 25% of born Muslims end up leaving the faith in the West. Now, maybe many of these people grew up in very secularized families to begin with and never really had more than a kind of cultural, loose cultural attachment to Islam, Allahu A'lam. But we tend to look when we talk about, for example, the number of Muslims in America, how are we counting that number? We're counting it by the number of sort of born Muslims from like a Muslim background with Muslim names. And so that is kind of how we, uh, you know, judge our numbers. And probably if you take it from an actual belief angle, you would have to cut out a lot of those people. And if it's true that 25% are leaving, that's really quite uh, startling. We often say Islam is the fastest growing religion in America. But according to these statistics, Islam is actually not growing at all. Um, it's still doing better than other religions, however, because other religions are bleeding and hemorrhaging and losing members without replacing them. Whereas Islam, because there are quite a, you know, is quite a substantial number of converts, it seems that we're at least replacing, you know, people who leave out the back door, you have new converts coming in to replace them. So Allahu Alam, but it seems like we are holding our numbers, but probably not increasing at the current time. Anyway, numbers is not what it's all about. Um, that's part of the sort of reign of quantity that's very characteristic of modernity that we don't actually want to adopt. And so quality is always more important than quantity. But nevertheless, you can see my point that many of us, you know, uh, people leave Islam because they find it not plausible or not ethical or not reasonable, given the uh, paradigm which is presented to them as the default. And so this is what we want to start to get to the bottom of. Um, so again, so what is a worldview? I've used this word several times now. And so let's talk a little bit more about what a worldview is. Um, so here's a definition that I found on the internet. It's as good as uh, any other. So I'll read this. A person's worldview represents his most fundamental beliefs and assumptions about the universe he inhabits. It reflects how he would answer all the big questions of human existence. Fundamental questions about who and what we are, where we came from, why we're here, where, if anywhere, we're headed, the meaning and purpose of life, 
the nature of the afterlife, if there is such a thing, and what counts as a good life here and now. Okay, so all of the major questions of, of, of existence that thinking people have always asked themselves. Few people think through these issues in any depth, which is a problem for us, uh, and fewer still have firm answers to such questions. But a person's worldview will at least incline him towards certain kinds of answers and away from others. Okay, so worldview is sort of a comprehensive, uh, the, the, it's the sum total of all of the fundamental assumptions that you hold about the world. What exists, what doesn't exist, what does it mean when someone says, we know that X, Y, and Z is the case? What does it mean to know? What are the sources of knowledge? What, how, how can you establish something as a element of knowledge as opposed to just subjective belief, for example, right? Uh, what is a human being? Uh, how should one act? Is there a purpose to life, either the, the sort of existence of the universe uh, or my personal existence uh, as a human being? Um, or are these things, is there no objective purpose? And I'm left to sort of, uh, create and, and project my own purpose onto the world and so forth. So all of these come together and form the worldview. And as the uh, person here, this was actually taken from a Christian website, states, most people are very unaware of their worldview. Uh, it is something that lies very, very deep uh, within a person's psyche. It is acquired from the environment very much in the way a language is. And it's your worldview is the uh, paradigm through which you think and through which you view the world, and therefore it's very difficult to see it if you've not been trained to look at it and identify what its constituent parts are. It's like when you put glasses on, you see through the glasses, you don't see the glasses, right? Um, and so most people utterly take their uh, worldview for granted, just like if you grow up, especially in a monolingual environment, and you grow up just speaking one language, then you take your native language utterly for granted. Of course, all children acquire their native language or languages uh, in a non-reflective, completely natural uh, manner. And you open your mouth. And if you grow up in America, you open your mouth and English comes out. Like that's just what happens. And, and, and you, you, it can be very difficult to sort of see the structure of your native language until you actually sit down and are told, wait a minute, language has components. There are nouns and verbs and adjectives and here's how they interact. And especially when you now learn a second language, and then you see not all languages operate the same way. In English, for example, we put the adjective before the noun. I'm wearing a blue shirt. In Arabic, in the Latin languages, many others, it's the other way around. I'm wearing a shirt blue, right? And so when you st when you are exposed to another language, you say, oh, well, wait a minute. I didn't realize there was another way to do this, right? There are some basic sort of uh, universal probably categories that exist uh, presumably in all languages, like a category of nouns by which you denote substantive things, uh, words by which you denote qualities of those things. In English, we would call those adjectives, you know, verbs. So words that denote actions rather than things and so forth. Presumably, you know, these kind of generic categories would exist across all human languages because all human beings need to express these different generic categories of meanings. But the way each language works is very specific to that language. And again, it's not really until you uh, are exposed to another language that you can start to see that languages are actually uh, relative and, and they're not just to be taken uh, for granted. And I think when it comes to worldviews, it's very much the same thing. If you grow up in a unified, I don't know if anybody does anymore particularly, but if you grow up in a relatively unified worldview, you will simply uh, adopt uh, notions about the world, notions about truth, notions about reality, uh, notions about value and meaning that that you will simply acquire and reproduce uh, uh, totally automatically without even thinking that there's a, possibly another way that the world can be seen or interpreted or that something other than what you already believe could actually be true. Um, of course, as Muslims, uh, because we do exist sort of very consciously between two worldviews, we are probably more aware of what a worldview is at least in terms of the effects it leaves on our hearts, as I said, than a lot of other people in modern society for whom there really is no contender. There is no serious kind of Christian worldview, except for, you know, there are obviously some people who still hold to that, but for a great many of people, a great many number of people in the modern world, the past kind of religious worldview is over. It's, 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 it's a thing of the past and everyone is essentially a modern person. And we'll talk about what that means. Um, and, and there really is no other paradigm outside of which to think or, or with which to compare or evaluate the modern paradigm. I think as Muslims, we have a unique position because, you know, we very consciously adhere to a paradigm that is 
different, has different roots and assumptions than the modern, you know, sort of secular worldview, again, that comes out of a secularizing Europe. Um, and because we are still, by and large, clinging onto that, uh, we are aware very, you know, we are aware of the, of, of the differences. It's like also, I mean, again, the, the, the analogy with language is very apt here. Many Muslims uh, uh, are at least bilingual, if not trilingual. Uh, many people in the United States and in Western Europe are, say, second generation Muslims. They often speak, obviously, the dominant language of their society, as well as a, a home language, Urdu, Arabic, you know, whatever Turkish language it might be. Um, and so, you know, most Muslims are aware that, okay, there are different ways of talking or different ways that languages can describe reality because they have at least two languages and they can see that they don't really uh, say things the same way, right? They don't also conceptualize the world the same way either. Um, and so I, and, and so when it comes to worldview, it's, it's, it's the same for us. Now, to push the linguistic example a little bit further, if I may, uh, as probably most of you know, if you are uh, bilingual or grew up, you know, in, in a, a, a family with parents who came from uh, elsewhere to the United States or Europe, um, you know, you will know that the two languages are often in your mind are not equal, right? Most, most people growing up, especially in the United States, are not what they would call balanced bilinguals. They are obviously dominant in one language, usually the, the, dom the, 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 the you know, ambient language of society, in our case, English. Um, and the home language is sort of L2, language two, it's a second language. Um, and, and, you know, the mastery of it obviously is less, and it's not the parents' mastery who grew up in the home country. Um, often there's also a lot of code switching uh, in immigrant families, which means that, you know, uh, even the parents after, you know, decade or two who grew up native in whatever uh, language from back home, they've lived in the U.S. so long, the whole life around us goes on English. So when they speak, they start mixing a lot of English in, you know, half Urdu, half English, half Arabic, you know, uh, or whatever, um, uh, you know, English, Arabic type thing. When it comes to languages, just, you know, you can have whatever attitude you want about language purity and whether it's desirable or not to mix codes like that. But in the end of the day, you know, language to a, at least a substantial degree is a practical tool of communication. And there isn't a question of, you know, there's no moral value attached to it. You're not, you know, you're not going to be held accountable by Allah, for example, on the Day of Judgment because you didn't speak a pure Urdu at home or, you know, you mixed Arabic with French or something like that, right? But when it comes to the worldview, you know, many of us are doing the same thing. We're kind of code switching, a lot of code switching. So in certain aspects of our lives and in certain um, circumstances, we are very Muslim, particularly in a masjid. We think Islamically. We kind of say the right things and sort of, you know, conceive of the world, presumably in a way that's, you know, in line with, with, with Islamic teachings. But then when we go out or we're in another setting, we often don't realize it, but we slip into a very different set of assumptions. We use a very different kind of language, and we often appeal to a very different set of uh, foundational principles. And so there's kind of a, you know, worldview code switching that goes on. And the reason this is more of a problem, uh, as opposed to the language example, is that when it comes to the worldview, we're talking here about questions of truth. We're talking here about questions of reality. We're talking about here about questions of what is and is not we're talking about questions of what's right and wrong, halal and haram, right? And these have obviously a direct bearing on our, uh, our, you know, what kinds of people we are in this world and also on our ultimate destiny in the hereafter. So it's actually quite dangerous if our worldview starts getting mixed up and we start uh, code switching carelessly and come out with a mishmash, right? And then the other thing that's even more dangerous about that is that just like in language, this type of code switching doesn't really last very long. In most immigrant families, you will find that the first generation has some command of the home language, but by the second generation, i.e. the immigrant people's grandchildren, you know, and certainly great-grandchildren, almost always the home language is completely gone by that time, and only the dominant language remains. Um, and so it's only English and no Urdu, no Arabic, no home language. Right. Again, that's sort of a natural language assimilation that, that, that takes place. The problem is if this happens with our worldview, the analogy would be second generation believes much in Islam, maybe kind of modernized a bit, Americanized a bit. The next generation, it's much more Americanized, modernized, secularized. And we'll talk more about this with a more tenuous you know, connection to actual normative Islamic beliefs and teachings by the third or fourth generation. What's going to be left? 
right? So the, so because you're code switching and mixing and matching, right? Ultimately, one dominates, and just like English will dominate linguistically, also the ambient worldview will, if we're not aware of what's going on, can easily come to dominate without us actually uh, knowing that it's that going on. Okay, so let me let me move on. So just a few more, and we'll go quickly. Worldviews shape and form. Uh, inform our experiences of the world around us. Like spectacles with colored lenses, they, they affect what we see and how we see it. Depending on the color of the lenses, some things may be seen more easily or conversely, they may be, may be de-emphasized or distorted. Indeed, some things may not be seen at all. Worldviews also largely determine people's opinions on matters of ethics and politics. What a person thinks about abortion, euthanasia, same-sex relationships, environmental ethics, economic policy, public education, and so on, will depend on his underlying worldview more than anything else. Again, most people don't um, articulate it in this way. And, and you'll see many people fight about these issues, abortion and this and that, all of these other things. And they don't realize that, in fact, the opinions that they're holding are really the logical uh, entailments of very deep lying assumptions, foundational assumptions that are by and large unexamined by most people. And because they're unexamined, people don't really know how to navigate either their conflicts between themselves and others, or again, the conflicts between within themselves, right? Where, where you're hearing one thing from one side, another thing from another side, and you don't know how to navigate the, uh, the rupture. So as such, worldviews play a central and defining role in our lives. They shape what we believe and what we're willing to believe, how we interpret our experiences, how we behave in response to those experiences and how we relate to others. Our thoughts and our actions are conditioned by our uh, worldviews, right? So we actually are impacted much more than we think by our worldview. And that's why it behooves us really to, to kind of grasp what a worldview is and then what our worldview is as Muslims, what the surrounding dominant worldview of our age is, which is kind of the modern secular paradigm. And then to see in what ways these overlap in which in what ways they diverge from each other and what are the implications of that overlap and quite often that divergence and again how can we sort of navigate those uh, gaps 